about 11 minutes before they were distracted and pulled away. Either an email came through or somebody knocked on the door or a phone call came up and they were juggling on average 12 different projects. It would take them something like 25 minutes before they got back to doing that first thing they started doing. You want to talk about a lot of work getting done or at least a lot of activity happening, but not quite possibly completing anything. So it feels like you have this mountainous amount of work coming your way and you just don't feel that sense of accomplishment. That's way too much. That'll build a lot of stress in your life. Now this one I found quite interesting and I might have to challenge the researchers on it. <laughs> because they say that people who are in healthy marriages, sometimes marriages can be something of a stress buster for men not necessarily for women. In Health Psychology, the January 2008 issue, men who felt stressed on the job every day, they came home and they felt better. Women, uh-uh. Wonder why. There was a neuroscientist at uh, the University of Virginia. He did a, took a closer look at this thing. I'm about to make some men mad here for a minute. <laughs> But there was a neuroscientist at the University of Virginia, and what he did was this little experiment. He told all of these married women, okay, I'm going to put you in an MRI machine. That takes a picture of your brain and the activity in your brain. He says, I'm going to put you in this MRI machine, and you're going to receive this painful electric jolt. But you have the option of holding your spouse's hand. So the women were like, okay, they did it. And so for the women who were in healthy marriages, when they were told they were going to have this electric jolt, they held their husband's hand. And ladies, it was almost like an analgesic. He was a painkiller for her. She held his hand and there was virtually no activity in the area of the brain where pain would be produced. But when he looked at women who didn't feel that they had the support they needed in their marriages, when he told them he was going to do it, there was all types of activity going on in the brain. In fact, I think the women felt better about receiving that painful electric joke than they did about holding their husband's hand. <laughs> But that's my observance. What they thought, though, what they postulated from this was this. You know, unlike men who could go home and sit in their recliner with their remote control and wait for dinner to be prepared, women felt like they were, you know, coming on shift number two, had to punch that clock. Because before they even walked in the door, they might have to stop and pick up groceries. And then when they got home, they had to prepare the dinner. And if they had to prepare for tomorrow, there might be some homework or ironing to be done or laundry or... If kids are involved, my gosh, you got to go pick them up from somewhere or take them somewhere. And if it's a little kid, you have even greater responsibilities. You know, you might have to help them with their homework. And, oh, if you're in that life sandwich where you have to take care of your children and then take care of your ailing, aging parents or your in-laws, you have to do that too. And, oh, if you got it all together by about 10 o'clock at night, you might have to reach for that satchel that has all of that extra work left over from work you didn't get done today because you're juggling 12 different projects. So for us, it's not as good. Anybody in agreement with that for me? With me? Yeah. <laughs> I thought so. Yeah. So we need to take a chill pill, the women especially. And you know what? I think we can learn something from our European counterparts. Because here in the United States, on average, we get about four weeks of vacation or take about four weeks of vacation. And I was really surprised by that number because I don't know a single soul who takes four weeks of vacation. But nonetheless, they say we do. And Americans tend to work more weeks a year than anybody else. However, our European cohorts got it right. They are mandated. It is a law that they have to take four weeks of vacation. And as a result, they on average will take about seven weeks. We should learn from that. But since we can't do that, let's just look at some other ways in which we can bust some of this stress. All right, here's how we can do it. I have a few ideas that they don't cost a whole lot and it's something you can do today and any day. First of all, we do need to get better organized. I mean, in order to find that time that you need to relax and to de-stress, you need to get better organized. Um, we need to get as much rest as we can get. If you eat better, exercise a little bit more, it'll help. Stop smoking, stop the alcohol intake. If you can avoid taking medications, please do so. I know we talked about the sleeping pills a little bit earlier, and, and sleep is just a huge, huge part of this. You know, I don't know about you, but, you know, some people, I remember when I was really, really stressed, I'd go through this litany of things that I had to do. You know, you get in the bed and you're just running through that checklist, you're running through that checklist, you're running through that checklist, and, oh, my gosh, you're getting all worked up over the, all the things you need to get done. Well, it's just depriving me of sleep. I couldn't fall to sleep right away. 
Or if you're one of those people who do zonk out really quickly just because you're so brain dead and, and worn out from the, the stresses of the day, you might fall asleep quickly, but you're waking up somewhere in the middle of the night. So the quality of your sleep is not good. We have to find other ways other than medications to reach that quality that we need. Um, take only medications that are prescribed for you and please refrain from any street pharmaceuticals. Thank you. <laughs> Think differently if we can stop those thoughts of worry. You know, Earl Nightingale has this wonderful thing he talks about. I think it's called a secret garden. And he, he compares it to um, a farmer who has this very, very fertile land, you know, and he says whatever that farmer plants in that land, that land is going to yield it back to him. So if he's planting corn, the land's going to give him back corn. The land doesn't care what you put in it. It's going to give you back what you give it. So if you plant cabbage, it's going to give you back cabbage. He talks about some type of poisonous plant called nightshade. If you plant that poisonous plant, it's going to give it right back to you. So he compares that to the mind. Whatever you plant in your mind, that's what you're going to get back. So if you plant doubt and fear and dread and stress, that's what you're going to get back. However, the opposite is also true. If you implant hope and optimism and a can-do spirit and a will-happen spirit, then you will get that back as well. So if we can avoid those very negative thoughts that rob us of our personal sense of well-being and peace of mind, then we can cut down on some of our stress. How about working on letting things go that you just can't change? So many of us take on other people's problems. Learn to say no. Yes, I can give you 20 ways. Learn to say no. There's so many people who will take care of their own stresses by giving it over.